grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning once wrote, and Mike, if we could pull this up on the screen here, Earth's crammed with heaven, in every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. Earth's crammed with heaven, in every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. I think she's on to something. She's on to the wonders of our God who comes down here to earth to set it afire with his presence. A God that wants to be living and active in each one of our lives. In fact, the Apostle Paul here at the end of Romans chapter 11 addresses this same wonderful God that, that brings his presence down to you and me here on earth. The Apostle Paul, sort of in this benediction, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. How amazing is our God. How, how unsearchable are His judgments and inscrutable His ways. Here the Apostle Paul is talking about the greatness of our God. This God that, that comes down once again to, to, to bring heaven to earth, to bring His very presence to you and me. Of course, this is something that Adam and Eve knew about very much. Right, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they, they walked in God's presence. Literally, it was a place where heaven and earth met. It, it was perfect. There was no separation between them. There was no separation between their God. They walked and they talked in communion with God, and, and it was good. The earth was crammed full of heaven. The earth was crammed full of God's presence as Adam and Eve were in a perfect relationship with Him and one another. But you guys know the story, right? Adam and Eve weren't content with that, and a, sort of this hyper-individualism took over, and they decided they wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to be like God, and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And before they even realized it, it no longer was, was earth crammed with heaven, the first thing they realized is they were naked and they were ashamed and they went and they hid. The relationship with God was broken. Death enters the picture. Relational disputes enter the picture. They start blaming one another. All of a sudden, it doesn't look like heaven on earth anymore. Yet still God comes down. Right? God comes down with, with a promise that, that He is still going to be with us, that He is going to come down to us and once again restore His presence, once again restore His kingdom of heaven to you and me. And if you look out at the world today, right, what do you see? Do you see earth crammed with heaven? Do you see earth crammed with this magnificent, wonderful God out there? My bet would be probably not. Right? When you look out at the world around you, what do you see? Brokenness, pain, right? pandemic, strife, divisions, cancer. It doesn't look very good. It doesn't look, if you look outside in our world, like heaven is meeting earth anymore. But here's the thing. We have a God whose ways does not make any sense. We have a God whose ways are perfect, and what He chooses to do is come down and once again cram this very broken world full of His presence, full of His kingdom of heaven. And, and of course, that's what Jesus does. Everywhere Jesus goes, Jesus is bringing the kingdom of heaven. He's cramming the earth full of God's presence once again. And where does Jesus go? He goes to people in brokenness. He goes to sinners. He forgives them of their sins. 
He goes to people who are healed and can't be healed, and he touches them, and he heals them of these horrible diseases. He goes to those who are dead and have no hope, and he calls them forth to life. That's what Jesus does. And our Gospel lesson is really telling because Jesus takes the disciples way up north into like the pagan hill country where all of these people are worshiping all of these different false gods. And he, he asks his disciples, he says, hey guys, who, who do you say that I am? They kind of don't answer the question, right? He says, no, no, no. Who, who do you say I am? And Peter, he gets it. Right? He says, you're the Christ. You're, you're the Son of the living God. You're the one, Jesus, who's once again bringing heaven back to earth. You're the one who God is God's anointed one to restore God's presence to people. And he's seen Jesus do this. Because that's what Jesus does. He goes to people living in the middle of sickness. He goes to people living in the middle of pain. He goes to people whose lives are all messed up like yours and mine. And he brings heaven to us as He forgives us of our sin, as He gives us the promise of life, as ultimately He goes to the cross where He sacrifices and He dies for you and me. And He's raised to life that we once again might come back into God's presence. As Jesus dies on the cross, the temple curtain is torn in two. That place of sacrifice becomes the place literally where heaven and earth meet. And the Apostle Paul is picking up on this language as he says, you all now strive to be those living sacrifices. You see, the the place of sacrifice always has been the place where heaven and earth met. In the Old Testament, God's people would just run their lives all over the place, complete messes. But God would always come down to them. And in the Old Testament, we would come down to a very specific place in the the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle or the temple, and the the priests would come in with the the sacrifice. On behalf of all of God's people, they'd, they'd come up to the altar and he'd sacrifice before the Lord. And literally, God's presence, God's glory was in that space behind the curtain. Heaven and earth were meeting there in the Holy of Holies, and God was forgiving His people as heaven met earth. Here, Jesus is that sacrifice for you and me. He is that that place where heaven and earth meets. God is cramming the earth once again full of heaven through what Jesus does. Right? And the Apostle Paul picks up on that language. He says, because earth has been crammed with heaven, because Jesus has come and died for you and been raised for you, because Jesus' Spirit lives in your heart as you've been baptized, He implores us. He said that should change how we live. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 12. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect? The Apostle Paul says, strive to be that living sacrifice. As Jesus has come to you, as His Spirit fills you up, as you are transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ, He implores you to become a living sacrifice. What does that look like for you? Right? Having had Christ bring His kingdom of heaven to you, claim you as His own, you are now a living sacrifice. What does that look like for you every day? Right? What does that look like for you as you gather on a video chat with all of your family and friends from across the country? You are a living sacrifice. Right? What does that look like for you <laughs> as you gather around your dinner table with the people that you eat dinner with? What does that look like for you as you go to your workplace or the place where you volunteer and everybody is just full of anxiety and worry? What does it look like for you to be a living sacrifice there? See, being a living sacrifice, or being a sacrifice, I should say, it isn't easy, right? It it implies giving up something. I think we have a hard time with that. 
Right? Paul says because of Jesus, because of His sacrifice, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds to become these living sacrifices. But that's not easy. It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to say what we should do, but it's hard to actually go through with that. I think it's sometimes our individualism and our selfishness gets in the way. Right? Think back to Jesus when he's way up north with, with all of uh, the disciples and he's asking them, who do you say I am? And, and Peter nails it. He says, you're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. You're restoring heaven back to earth, basically, with what he meant by that situation, by that phrase. And then Jesus, the next thing he goes on to say, basically, is, guess what, guys? I'm going to suffer, I'm going to sacrifice, and I'm going to die. And remember what Peter said? He's not comfortable with sacrifice. No, Jesus, far be it from you, Lord. That should never happen to you. Right? We don't like this idea of sacrifice, but... Here's the thing, God gets it. And he becomes this living sacrifice as Jesus stretches out his hand on the cross for you and me. That we might be crammed once again full of God's presence. That we might once again be in communion with God like Adam and Eve were in the very beginning. That we can go to God any time because of Jesus. We're not a dead sacrifice. He's a living sacrifice. Jesus lives. There, there's hope on the other side of this sacrifice. And that's what the Apostle Paul calls us to live in. Not just, not just sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice, but we're part of the living sacrifice. We have the hope of Jesus that is with us, that has come through His sacrifice, and is living here and reigning now and forevermore. So what does this look like? Paul says, well, this is what it looks like. He continues. He says, for by... The grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though our many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Right? The first thing he said, which has kind of been his theme, this section of Romans, is be humble, right? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. But as Jesus is alive, as he's poured out his spirit on each one of us, he's given us different gifts to go love and serve. Right? It's not going to look the same one for everybody, but, but as we collectively work as a community around the living sacrifice Jesus, right, God works through us, through our various gifts, to literally bring heaven to the people around us. To literally bring the very presence of God and His restoration to people around us that are very much hurting, because that's what God does. God comes down to people who are hurting. He comes down to you and me, as we are a community surrounded, or, surrounded by Jesus or surrounding ourselves around Jesus, we are part of those living sacrifices using the gifts that the Spirit has given to us for the love and service of our neighbor. I've never been to London. Some of you probably have. There's all sorts of monuments in London. You know, Big Ben, Parliament, all, all, the, all the monuments that are there. But there's another monument that you probably missed if you ever have been to London. It's three miles east of the city center at Three Mills Green. Has anybody seen this statue, two hands holding one another, stretching their arms out for one another? It's not very famous, but it's in a park, and it memorializes the centennial of the Industrial Revolution. And what this really memorializes is a group of men who were working in a well. One of them was named Thomas Pickett, and the well became overcome with carbonic acid, foul air. So as he was working there, another man by the name of Godfrey Nicholson responded and reached out his hand to help. He was followed by Frederick Elliott and then Robert Underhill, each stretching out his hand in service and sacrifice for his neighbor, and each one giving his life as he stretched out his hand. That's what sacrifice looks like. 
That's what these men did for one another. But here's the thing, their, their sacrifice didn't ultimately give any hope. We have a man who reaches out his hand in sacrifice for you and me, the man Jesus. And he sacrifices, but he brings us to life. And now you are surrounded with that life. So as you reach out your hand in sacrifice for your neighbor, you know it, it doesn't end in a dead-end road. It ends in life because Jesus has been brought back to life for you and for me and for your neighbor. So as you live your life, in a world full of anxiety, in a world full of worry, see that the Lord is once again cramming earth full of heaven. He's done it through Jesus, who is the King of heaven, who has brought the kingdom of heaven to you and me, and let his Spirit work in you as you use those very gifts to literally let God bring his kingdom of heaven to all those you encounter as you and I are built up to become those living sacrifices. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.